Well, I'm excited to be up here today. How many of you have ever experienced um, what it feels like to be in a crushing or pressing crowd? Okay, lots of hands in here, all right? Is that like walking to a Ducks game? What is that? Is that kind of, that's what it's here? I remember a Thanksgiving um, night around like 11.45 p.m., the anticipation was stirring to enter into a Walmart. Um, <laughs> You know, because you gotta you gotta get there to beat the deals and to get the um, Black Friday prices. Now they start Black Friday on like the third, like the Wednesday before, like Monday of, like the week of Thanksgiving. It's like it's just Black November, I guess. I don't even know anymore. But I remember they're going there. We were up in uh, Nevada, getting ready to go into a uh, Walmart to help my uh, nephew get like his, uh, well, my sister and her husband to buy their ne- their son um, a toy. And I remember just all of a sudden it was like, let's go. And everyone was just cramming in and we were rushing. And like some lady came and I elbowed her and she fell on the ground. And um, <laughs> no, I didn't. That was my sister hitting her with the cart on accident. Okay. But um, I don't know how to describe it because it, like in America, we, we don't really like confined spaces. In fact, I was hearing a story about someone who was traveling in China and they, they were saying when they were getting on um, kind of the, the, the transit, it was kind of like the people were shoving and it wasn't rude. They were just trying to make sure they got on. She said, I had to, I had to like firm, be firm and hold my ground. And, and in, in like America, it's like, get away. You have germs, especially, you know, s- social distancing. Like nowadays, it's like even, even worse. But Middle Eastern crowds are very much like the Asian crowd that I was, someone was describing to me um, when they were in China, the, the idea of being pressed upon and, and pushed and moved and like you really have to fight for your, for your space. And here in our story, that is kind of the scene. And, and the only thing I could think of was like, you know, shopping on Black Friday at Walmart to get, you know, a toy that's going to break in four months or a toy that they're going to play with for a month and, um, and never want to play with again. So forgive me for my analogy, but that's how I see it. So imagine being in like the center of this crowd. You know, the crowd is pressing in, and today we're going to go through these six verses of Mark. I'm going to help us understand the text, and then we'll figure out kind of how we, how we have to, um, or the two implications, the two questions that are implied in out this, throughout this text. But that is the scene. This is Jesus going to a new region, probably same area around Capernaum, kind of around that home base area, and the crowd is pressing in. And in chapter 3, verse 7, it starts out with this. It says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed him. I just kind of want to, I want to pause there. And this is actually a play on words in a second, but notice how Jesus, he withdraws um, with his disciples, gets away from the crowd. And I started to ask myself, why is he doing that? And I remembered, oh yeah, last week, right? The Pharisees got together with the Herodians and they're planning to kill Jesus. So there's a very practical element. Jesus is like, if I'm over here, they're probably going to find me and they're going to, they're going to kill me. So in a way he's breaking off. He is withdrawing from the plot to kill him. We talked about last week how um, on the Sabbath day, he healed a man with a withered hand. You know, what's better to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? And the Pharisees were silent. And so he won the debate and then they get all mad and ticked off because the man with a withered hand is brought to restoration. And so they go out and plot to kill him. So that's the reason why. But I also think um, it's showing something about Jesus. He exemplifies the unhurried life. Now, I don't know if you in here ever feel like you're just always on the go. Does anyone ever relate to that? A few people, okay. Now, one of the biggest things I realized when we moved from California to Oregon is that Oregonians, right? That's the correct term, right? Okay, you're all, yeah, that is. Okay, cool. Um, They're not as pressured up about life as Californians, all right. That's I, one of the things I've been telling people. They're like, How, "How's Oregon?" And I usually kind of, I've been, I, I should write a paper on it because I've answered the question so many times. But I usually say, "Well, it's it's a little slower paced." All right. Like I, I can get on. I think it's called the 126. I'm starting to know know the names and of the roads and getting on and getting off and coming to here and going and taking my son to school and kind of making it. We have our little stores we shop at and stuff. But I never in Oregon feel like the pressure of you gotta get moving. All right. Um, California, not the case. All right. But Jesus here, he exemplifies this unhurried life. So when I moved to Oregon, I, I experienced kind of the unhurried life a little bit more than I did um, in California. And we went to Montana last year for a church conference, and that's like the ultimate unhurried life, all right? So, um, but home on the range, will do that to you. Here, Jesus, though, paused on purpose. We saw in chapter one that he retreated to be alone with the Father. Remember that night? 
after the demon, the, the, un, the unclean, defiling spirit chased after him in the, in the synagogue, ran right up to him. And Jesus said, like, shut up, get out of him and goes home to Simon. Peter, mother, his mother-in-law heals her. Peter's house reaches down, picks up the mother-in-law. If you ever notice, I try to like replay the story over and over again every time. So you understand and tracking with me, right? That was a long day there. And then after, because he, he cast out the demon and then he healed Peter's mother-in-law, the whole entire town brought everyone to the door. And Jesus was healing the sick and casting out demons. And then after that, well, it was still early in the morning, which means like probably 2 a.m., which is still like in the night, he goes out to be with the Father to pray and to refocus and to refresh and to be renewed. So we see this with Jesus. This time, though, he brings his disciples with him. So on the one hand, yes, he's getting away from those who are trying to plot to kill him, but he's also pausing in the midst of the chaotic ministry that he's going, that he's on right now in the activity, and he's pausing on purpose. That's just a little side note, but for us, um, if you're in this place in life where you're constantly, you feel like you're hurrying or it's one thing after another, I would encourage you to follow after Jesus and just to withdraw for a little bit and to pause on purpose, all right? And then to refocus, to renew, and to be refreshed, all right, as you go about your life and your ministry. But here's kind of one of the summary statements of our passage today. Jesus's ministry is growing in popularity because of his authority displayed in teaching, healing, and exorcism. So if you're taking notes on your like sermon note handouts in there, would you use in your life groups to help answer those questions with your life groups? That's the first fill in the blank is his authority. Notice in uh, chapter three, verse seven, um, we just read that. So verse eight says, when they all, excuse me, when they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon, all right? So many people came to him. And the listing of those cities is interesting. We have some on the north, some on the east, some on the south, some on the northwest. And really, it's almost like kind of a a way for for Mark to say that Jesus' activity, his ministry is extending beyond Jerusalem, extending beyond just the Jews, all right? He was supposed to be a light for the Gentiles. The Old Testament talked about when the Messiah would come, he would be a light to the Gentiles, right? So Jesus's ministry, when you see Tyre and Sidon, that's that's kind of out there regions, like where Gentiles would be, but people are still flocking to him and running to him, literally crowd, the crowd is crowding him, all right, in this passage. And I said that um, because of his authority, there's authority in teaching. Several of the stories already, he comes into a town, he starts teaching about the kingdom of God. And then he will demonstrate its power. That's a theme I've tried to hammer in over and over each week that I've been up here is he teaches about the kingdom of God and then demonstrates its power. But in one of the stories, everyone listens to him. They go, this guy actually teaches with authority. Yeah, not like those jokers over there, those scribes who are professional, you know, uh, professors and they, they know the law. He actually teaches with authority. All right, he comes in and proclaims the kingdom of God. Remember, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. And then he shows the outworking of the kingdom. His authority in healing the sick. Remember, I've already said this today, but Peter's mother-in-law, who had a fever, he healed her. Then the whole town crushed out the door. He healed many people who were sick and demon-possessed. What about the man who was covered in leprosy, falls at the feet of Jesus? If you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus says, I am willing. So he reaches out and touches the man. What about the paralyzed guy? Remember the four friends couldn't get to Jesus because of the crowd. Oh, again, the crowd, again. And so they go up onto the side of the roof. They unroof the roof. They dig through, drop him in front of Jesus. Jesus forgives his sins. Then to show how much power he has over sin and over health in the body, he says, pick up, or get up, pick up your mat and go. He was the paralyzed man. And last week, there was a man with a withered hand and Jesus restored him. So People are hearing all the things he is doing. So what is he doing? He's teaching. He's healing the sick. He's also exercising demons, right? Unclean, defiling spirit. Remember that one in the synagogue ran up to Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, what do you want with us? You're the son of the most high. He says, shut up, get out of him. Well, now here in this sent- now in this section, many more people who were demon possessed. That night that the whole town brought all the people to, to Peter's uh, house after he healed the mother-in-law, it said many more people were demon possessed. So if you walk through and you're like, oh, I don't know if, what Jesus, if Jesus ever dealt with demons or unclean spirits, like I would just reread chapter one to three. It's like pretty evident, right? He is, a, he is an exorcist. 
Um, here in our story, they say something else about him, right? Anytime they would speak, they would call him the son of God, and he would, again, tell them to be quiet, strict orders not to tell anyone about him. So his authority is displayed in his teaching, his healing, and his exorcisms. All right, let's continue on in our passage today. Chapter 3, verse 9. We're almost finished. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. A little side note, do you think the crowd is a good thing in the story? Uh, no, not really. I would say no. You can have your argument, and that's fine. We'll talk about that later, okay? They're crowding him. It's, it's kind of like... like they keep showing up and they keep wanting something from Jesus. They keep like basically Jesus, like I want my will to be done on earth as I want it to be done. Or I think you should do it in heaven, right? The, the crowd, yes, they're saying some good things. They understand he's doing some things. Last one of the times they praised him, but here they're kind of inhibiting his mission, if you will. I mean, I was going to write in one of your notes, like if you're part of the crowd, watch out. Jesus might be running from you. Um, but I figured, you know, that might be too harsh. So, um, but they're crowding him. For he'd healed so many that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. And whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. This is my observation from the text. I think that the crowd wants the touch of God, but not the transformation of God. And this is what I get at when I think that the crowd in this story necessarily isn't a good thing. Eventually, in the book of Mark, they will turn on Jesus. There will be people when he's coming into town, like on the week before Easter, they're going to be cheering, yeah, our king's here, save us now. The king, the rest, rest, restore the kingdom of David, it's back in power, yay, save us now. That Hosanna means save us now, and that's the word they will chant. Save us now, save us now. And because he isn't the king they want him to be, they will say, crucify him, nail him to the cross. The popularity here is definitely in the form of enthusiastic admirers and selfish consumers. Oh, they're admiring everything Jesus is doing. It'd be like a, a subscriber today if you're like on YouTube. Have you ever seen on YouTube? It's like like, share, subscribe. Like that'd be like a subscriber. Like, yeah, I really like this person. I'm gonna buy some merch too. I really like what they say. You're enthusiastic about them. You like what they say. You like what they do. In fact, they love. They know what he does. Oh, he can fix my problem. But again, they're selfish consumers. I want what he has to offer. I don't want to follow him. I just want what he has to offer. They want Jesus to fix their problems. They don't want to drop everything and follow him. The very next section that Pastor Daniel is going to preach on next week, little spoiler alert, he's going to draw a line in the sand and he's going to call people out who actually are probably worthy to follow him or have shown that they want to follow him. Because up to this point, it's just kind of been a crowd, growing popularity, and they only want the touch of God. They don't want to surrender their life to God's will and God's purpose. I've said it a bunch of different ways. I like this way. They want the blessing Jesus offers without the obedience that Jesus requires. Again, how do we know that? They're crowding him to get what they want. Has he been saying, come and crowd me and I will heal all your diseases? No, he's been saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. You don't believe me? Paralyzed guy, get up, go. You don't believe me? Leprosy guy, your new skin, go ahead, walk around. You don't believe me? All the sick are well. You don't believe me? Demons, shut up and get out of here. God is at work and God is on the move. The kingdom of God is here. He's doing those things to prove that the kingdom of God is here. Not to prove, he's just, that's just showing it. Look, you want to believe me? This is what it looks like when the kingdom of God isn't ruling in this world. So a question I kind of have to ask myself and ask our church is, in what ways do we exhibit the attitudes and actions of the crowd in this story? It's easy to like read the Bible and go, oh gosh, the crowd. Like they're so horrible. They're pressing Jesus. They're literally, crowd, the crowd is crowding him. That's, that was the funny part, that, like the, the play on words there. They're crouching in on him just to touch him. I just want to touch, I just want to touch him. I want to be better. They're not willing to, to follow him. So how do we exhibit the attitudes and actions of the crowd? Another, th another way we can look at this is the crowd is getting away, in the way of his mission. You ever notice that? Like he wants to go preach, but they're crowding around him. So he's like, get a boat ready. I got to get away from them. 
Get me a boat ready. And in another story, he will get on a boat and he will say, fine, if they're all crowding around me, I'm going to take advantage of this. He knows how to leverage situations. So he gets on the boat. He moves himself out a little bit and he looks out and because he knows, because he created like sound waves and water and mountains, he knows that when he speaks over the water, his voice will cast out and go up in the natural amphitheater of the range there. Different story. Another time. But at one point, he leverages the crowd to get out on the boat and say, I got to teach you about the kingdom of God. I'm not here to fix your problems. I'm here to bring a whole new kingdom of God. Will blessings come from being in the kingdom of God? Yes. Will, will problems be fixed? Most likely. But that's not why he came. So how often do we hinder the will of God because we want God to do our will and our bidding on earth as we want it to be done in heaven? Another observation from this text is that demon faith is not saving faith. Demon faith is not saving faith. What is the unclean spirit? What do they all cry out when they come to Jesus? You are the son of God. Now I wish I was there. I wanted to hear like, are they, are they screeching? Are they afraid? Like, are they, are they trembling? Are they shaking the person? Does the person's voice sound trembling? Again, this isn't the person saying, this is the, the unclean spirit speaking through the person. I wish I was there. But the confession that they say is it true or not? Yes, it is. Oh, that's a bad question. Is it true? Is what, he sa- what the demon says or the unclean spirit say, is it true? Yes. This is the second confession from a demonic, unclean, defiling, satanic spirit. You ever notice in the New Testament, the wording that we have for like these kinds of things is kind of like weird and like we don't really know how to say it. Is it it's defiling, it's, it's unclean, it's, it's kind of demonic, it's satanic. Well, God never really wanted those type of things in his world. They don't really fit in God's new world. So the New Testament doesn't have the best language for it because they don't really fit in what God is doing going forward. But do the demons say the right thing about Jesus? Yes, they do. Last one, they said, you're the son of the most high. Here they said, you're the son of God. James 2.19 says, you believe that there is one God good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. The demons clearly believe that Jesus is someone who has superior authority. I mean, this is evidenced in their confessions. They know it. They, they exactly say who, they is, who he is. However, the demons don't submit to Jesus as Lord, and they don't place their sole allegiance, allegiance to him as the world's true Lord. They follow someone else's will and someone else's purposes. They remain opposed to God's will and God's purposes and they continue their onslaught against the people of God and the kingdom of God. My point in the whole thing is, is we can say the right things about God. We can believe the correct things about God, but if we don't submit to his will and to his purpose, our faith isn't much different than demons. And some of you are like, gosh, that's harsh. Yeah, I've been checking that with myself too. I can say all the right things. I've, I've, trust me, I've gone to school. Um, that doesn't make me better than anyone. It just means I've read a lot of things. I know all the right things to say, but if my life isn't in submission to his lordship, then I'm not much better than a demon. And I might not be following Satan's will for this life, but I might be following my will for this life. And if I follow my will, I usually end up following my sinful desires and I continue to be separated from God. So he confesses that Jesus is the son of God. What does that mean? Let's take a deeper look. As son of God, Jesus is both messianic king and God's divine agent. That's your fill in the blank there. He is God's, uh, Jesus is the messianic king and God's divine agent. I'm going to define those for you so you don't get lost. Messiah is a word used in the Old Testament that means smeared one. I like saying it like that, but it's smeared one because they would anoint someone with oil, the anointed one, all right? The Old Testament talked about a time when God would anoint someone with his spirit to bring about the age of the spirit or the kingdom of God here on earth. That was the Messiah. It, it came to a point in second, second Temple Judaism that it would thought this would be the king of Israel. And so anytime we hear the word Messiah, we got to think of the word king, especially when Jesus comes onto the scene. So he is the messianic king, the one who's anointed with God's spirit to bring about God's age or God's kingdom here on earth. And in Mark chapter 1, verse 11, we got a hint at this. When Jesus was baptized, 
heaven was violently ripped open and the spirit of, uh, descended on him like a dove and a voice came from heaven and said, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. I usually go to English accent because it just sounds like God because all the movies I watch, sorry about that. But I didn't do that there. In his baptism, he has confirmed or affirmed publicly, you are my son. In Mark chapter nine, verse seven on the Mount Transfiguration, Jesus again will be publicly affirmed. This is my son, listen to him. Psalm chapter two, verse seven is an interesting psalm um, which speaks about this messianic king. It says, why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, his smeared, his Messiah, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Here's the kicker, verse seven. I wrote, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. And today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth, your possession, and you will break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like pottery. Psalm 2 became a psalm that was um, kind of the staple verse or the, 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 the section that they would use to think about this time when God would establish his Messiah as king over Jerusalem. And the New Testament writers in Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter one and Mark chapter nine, they see that in Jesus. They understand that about him. And so they say he is the messianic king. He is the one that Israel's been waiting for who will eventually rule over the entire world. But he's also though the divine agent and this is what we've seen in Mark so far. He arrives on the scene and he acts as God's agent here on earth in the kingdom of God. Like this is a significant theme in the first eight verses. So what does Jesus do as the divine agent? He proclaims the kingdom of God. He heals the sick. He casts out demons. He controls nature. We're going to get to a story where like the wind and the waves are crashing and he's sleeping and the disciples wake him up, right? And he goes, be quiet, be still. And everything just is quiet and still. And they're like, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. I'm getting excited for that section. He controls nature. He teaches with authority. And here's the big kicker too. He even forgives people of their sins. He is God's divine agent here on earth. That's what it means when the demon says, you are the son of God. And I can only imagine what the disciples are going through right now, right? If this is one of the, one of the maybe the, the kind of the biggest thoughts about the book of Mark is that this is potentially Peter kind of relaying some messages to Mark, kind of telling Mark the stories and Mark writes them down, right? I can only imagine like up to this point, the disciples haven't said one thing about who he is. They haven't answered the question. They've seen all the miracles. They've seen demons say who he is twice now, at least that we've read in, in the scripture. And yet they don't have an answer. Who is Jesus? And yet, even if we, if we go as far as the demons, they know he's the son of God. So behind all this, this whole story today, because that's our whole text, behind all this, there again, there are two big looming questions. We've, I think we've had, hit them before, but I want to hit them again. The first one is this, who is Jesus? Mark is asking that question all throughout his book. And at times he will, in a way, he'll remove the veil and say, here it is, here's a glimpse. And then he'll put the veil back on. And then another story, he'll remove the veil. Here's the answer and put it back on. But again, it, it's, it's one thing to follow Jesus and to be consumed with his popularity. It's another thing to, to, get, him, to get his identity right and who he is. And so I, if you have your notes, you'll see a bunch of them on there. But Mark 1.1, 1, 1, Mark 1.11, Mark 1.24, Mark 2.10, Mark 2.27-28, Mark 3.11. Those are all definitive statements about who Jesus is. In fact, the first verse, this is the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Right there. He's God's king. He's God's divine agent. He's the one we've been waiting for. A few verses later, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. A little bit later in verse 24, the demon, you are Jesus of Nazareth. You are the son of the most high. What do you, are you going to destroy us? We know who you are. Again, the demon calls it out. Chapter two, verse 10. I want you to know, Jesus talking, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He claims to be the one talked about in Daniel 7 who's given all authority and dominion and power, and he can actually forgive sins on earth. 
in chapter 2, verse 27 through 28, we're just kind of going through the text now. He says, the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. And today in our passage, the demons, one more time, says, you are the Son of God. So who is Jesus? Every single human being on earth has to answer that question or will be forced to answer that question at some point. Who is Jesus? So far, if you're tracking with the demons, you can get the answer right. So there's, there's kind of like, you know, here's the study guy for the final. We know it. Like, he is Messiah. He is son of God. He's the king. He's the agent. He's the Lord of the Sabbath, right? He is, he is a God here in human flesh. Well, that's reading Matthew's, you know, text or whatever. But here in Mark, those are the things that are said about Jesus. So do you see him for who he truly is? Mark has removed the veil several times already. Who is Jesus? But here's the second question. Are you with him or against him? Are you with him or are you against him? If the first question, who is Jesus, basically, who, who is he? What's, what's his identity? Can you, can you call him out? Can you, can you get the answer right when the question is asked? Because Jesus will, in a, soon will like, look at the disciples and say, who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? Well, some say this, some say that. And Peter goes, you're the Messiah. He's like, ding, 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 you got it right. He's like, I got to go all the way to the cross. I got to lay my life down. And Peter's like, no, we're not going to let that happen. He's like, you are Satan, get behind me. (laughs) Because that statement, although it was great, kind-hearted of Peter, was against the will of God, opposed what Jesus was going to do. Are you with him? Are you against him? I'm not going to read all those verses that are on there. You can see them on your notes. But really the first part shows every time someone was with Jesus, every time someone had enough faith to step out of the crowd, every time someone um, responded to what God did in their life, when Jesus touched them, it wasn't just the touch. They wanted the transformation. Every time that, that Jesus restored someone, every time he turned them around, you see the faith in these people so far. And again, you're going to see faith And you're going to see obedience. You're going to see, are you with him or are you against him? And the second list of verses where it starts, Mark 1, 24 and on, is talking about all the times that people have been plotting against him so far. Because those are the two underlying questions. Who is Jesus and are you with him or are you against him? And again, how you answer the second question will distinguish us, will help us distinguish ourselves like away from demons. Because the demons get that question right. Get, demons got question number one right. They fail miserably on number two. And ultimately they're going to be uh, destroyed because of that. And again, how far off are we from demon faith? We know the right things. We can say the right things about God, but we're not willing to submit our life and our purpose and our will to his purpose and his will. So again, those two big questions Mark is going to ask. He's asking here, again, behind the text, it's, it's kind of implied in here. Who is he? Are you following him? Are, are you with him or are you against him? There's a clear plot in here against him. Are you in the crowd? Are you standing in the way of God's mission? Or are you willing to say, you know what? I want to follow after him. I'm willing to leave my net behind. Another passage we talked about. I'm willing to leave my tax collector booth. I'm willing to submit Everything I've wanted, I'm I'm willing to give up my kingdom to be in his and follow his kingdom. Who is Jesus and are you with him or are you against him? Let's pray. God, I thank you for this morning. And Jesus, I thank you for your activity, for your mission. And I thank you that you give us a chance to participate in that mission. You commission us to continue your work through the power of your spirit. Jesus, I ask that we would get that first question right. We would know that you are the son of God. You are the long-awaited king. You are the risen king of the universe. And you are the one to whom we're supposed to give our full allegiance to. And Lord, help us with that second question. Help us to have the strength and courage to walk it out, to follow you to say no to our own kingdoms and to say yes to the kingdom of God. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, church family, I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Uh, it looks like maybe there's some sun might be coming out. I hope you get to enjoy that. Um, just want to re- uh, give you a, like a heads up real quick, okay, before we head out. Um, if you're in here in our like in-person service, if you don't use those... Uh, 
bulletins, all right? We're going to try to be good stewards, all right? But if you don't use your bulletin and you're just going to throw it away anyway, would you mind like dropping it off in the bulletin box in the back? I was talking with Linda. If that's one thing we can do to kind of help kind of use them again, because they, they haven't really changed, we like to keep that as some ongoing stuff. So if you're not going to take it home and use it, the outer part of it or the connection card in there, you can put them in the bulletin box um, in the back. But I encourage you to, if you're new to our church, to check out our Discover SFC next week. It'll help you find out who we are, what we're doing, and how you can um, take ownership of our church with us. As you go today, have some cookies and coffee. And why don't you ask somebody, are you for him or are you against him? I I don't know. You don't really have to do that, but we'll see you next week.